that's a quantum mechanical theory that has some features in common with ADS2, and we didn't know exactly what the gravity dual is. And the model had the nice advantage that we could solve for some aspects of the model. So now I would li we'd like to talk about some other model uh, where we do know what the gravity dual is, but we cannot solve it uh, uh, so easily. So, and uh, it, it takes harder work to do calculations uh, in this model. So the model is a model, again, with Majorana fermions. Um, this is the Lagrangian. Um, so it has uh, some Majorana fermions. Um, and it has lots of symmetries. In addition, it has some bosons. I'll discuss the bosons in just a second. Um, so we have these fermions, um, which uh, um, are 16 of these fermions. So we have a spinner index under uh, SO9. Um, and so, so this is a spinner index. And then uh, we can think of them as a matrix, uh, as an SUN adjoint matrix. Uh, so in addition, has uh, n squared components from the matrix. Of course, we can, I think, expand these matrices in a basis of, uh, of um, generators and think of this as really uh, 16. Uh, let's say A runs from 1 to n squared, and uh, alpha runs from 1 to 16. So we have the 16, uh, well, all this Majorana fermion, 16 times n squared. And this action is just the free action that we wrote before for the SYK model, which was the action of Majorana fermions. Now, the model, in addition, has a bunch of bosons. So there are nine bosons, xi, uh, and they have the same structure. They are, you can organize them in matrices uh, and with n uh, by n indices. And uh, again, there are nine of these indices. So there are nine, these transforms in the vector representation of SO9. So the model has an SO9 symmetry, <coughs> which is uh, clear from the construction of the indices here. Um, and uh, um, yeah, so it has an SO9 global symmetry. And it also has uh, 16 supersymmetries. So this, with this particular pattern of uh, interactions, it has 16 uh, supersymmetries. Um, and in the context of supersymmetries, sometimes, uh, so global symmetries, which uh, do not commute with the supercharges, or so supercharges have some SO9 indices, are called sometimes R symmetries. So, so that's uh, the, the structure of this model. Um, um, we, could, we could add, uh, so we could think of these uh, fields as um, uh, coordinates of, uh, let's say, if we neglect the potential, we have a bunch of coordinates uh, of like a free particle, right? Um, of, n, of nine times n squared free particles. And then next, they give, give some potential interaction. We could. We could also add a mass term. Uh, so sometimes it's convenient to add a mass term to this model where uh, there is a particular uh, mass term that we can add um, that um, um, so that um, has a particular form. So I'm going to just write it down explicitly, but it doesn't matter too much exactly what it is. It's just a form that is fixed by the requirements that uh, the requirement that preserves uh, still preserves 16 supercharges. Um, so the details are not important. What you should get here is that there are a bunch of terms you could add to this model. Um, that preserve many of the symmetries, preserve the same number of uh, supersymmetries. And uh, um, yeah. So we can add all these uh, sort of um, mass terms, uh, and they preserve uh, the same number of supercharges, but with a slightly different algebra. The algebra now is the algebra of SU2 uh, slash 4, okay, so some particular supergroup. Um, OK, so this. These details are not important, but what I wanted to mention about this mass term is that now we have a bunch of harmonic oscillators, so we can think of the Majorana fermions 
interacting with just a bunch of harmonic oscillators. So at weak coupling, uh, at very weak coupling, uh, so here we introduced an overall coupling constant. I mean, of course, we can remove it from here and put it in these other terms. Um, or we could even uh, rescale it. And um, Now, well, maybe I should. So in, in this quantum mechanical theory, uh, this uh, coupling constant is some kind of an over overall scale, in the same way that we had the J in the SYK model that sets a scale. And at very high energy scales or short distances, the theory is essentially free. And the same happens here. And then at uh, longer distances or longer times, uh, the theory becomes strongly interacting. And this just simply sets the, the overall energy scale for when the strong interactions are going to happen. So when you are at, um, so if uh, you are at extremely weak coupling, then uh, you has simply have a bunch of harmonic oscillator. And then uh, at the, when the coupling is stronger, this uh, will develop some non-trivial dynamics. Um, OK. Now, the idea is that um, the gravity dual of uh, this matrix model, well, first of all, I should say that uh, this matrix model um, is also the, uh, describes the dynamics of uh, the zero brains in uh, string theory. So you can, if you have a bunch of the uh, zero brains all sitting at the same location, so we have some open strings uh, living on the D zero brain, and at low energies, the dynamics of these open strings uh, are described as this simple uh, matrix model that we have over there. Um, and um, okay, good. So this uh, these zero brains can also they have some mass and some energy, and they curve the space. And when you look at the geometry they create, so we have some. Um, so the li this li far away we have some r one comma nine space, right, flat space. And then as we approach the location of the brains, we have a geometry that, uh, roughly speaking, uh, has a shape like this. So the sphere sort of sunk or shrinks and then expands a little bit again. And it's described by a metric uh, that uh, has this form. So, um, so it's a metric that, uh, well, that, that's the, the metric for this case. So this is the metric for the so-called extremal uh, D0 brain. So here uh, we've solved Einstein's equations, 10-dimensional Einstein's equations, um, with the, for a charge object that carries the D0 brain charge. So the D0 brain charge in 10 dimensions carries some electric field. So they're electrically charged and they're one electric field. And um, uh, we are solving a spherically symmetric uh, spherically symmetric situation, and we can consider a black hole with that carries that charge, a Schwarzschild, let's say, black hole plus with this charge now, and then we can take the the limit where the mass has the lowest uh, possible value with that charge, um, and then we get uh, this particular metric. So we have uh, rotational symmetry around the D0 brains, so the D0 brains are a point in uh, nine dimensions, so we have an SO9 symmetry, okay? And uh, that those are the symmetries of this eighth sphere. Then there is a radial direction, um, and of course the time direction. And there is a, so there is the, we have a function like this, uh, which uh, well uh, solves the Laplace equation in the transverse dimensions. So this is r to the seventh, just the solution of the Laplacian in nine dimensions. And well, you can relate the parameters appearing here to uh, the parameters of the D0 brain. So this requires uh, some calculation. You can calculate this, this coefficient. You have to properly quantize the D0 brain electric field and so on. Yes, please. Uh, two F. Yeah, they are the same. Yeah, the one here and here. Yeah. Um, so that's uh, that's in general the metric. So for example, for very large R. Uh, at this f goes to 1, and we recover the metric of flat space. Right? So that's the metric very far away. Then for very small r, we uh, have something else. Okay? Um, and then you can define this, you can take, uh, when you are at very low energies, so this is a redshift factor, and uh, at very low energies, you can have, uh, the, you can have excitations that have very low energies in this region, uh, that are very deep in the, um, gravitational potential. Um, so this, for very small r, this becomes very large, and this becomes very small. And so um, you have a huge uh, redshift factor. And so you can have low energy excitations 
uh, living down here. And so you can take a low energy limit, and in the low energy limit, um, you can drop this one, and the excitations uh, divide into two parts, the ones that live far away and the ones that live very close. Um, so after dropping this one, so I'm going to drop this one now. So this, after dropping this one, the geometry uh, now has a different form. So it, uh, it's a bit more like a, like a cone like this. Okay, it becomes uh, sort of singular at uh, this uh, position where we had a kind of neck. Um, and uh, and what we can rewrite it. This is a very minor rewrite of uh, what we had over here. Um, so we can define. See here, here have defined uh, the overall radius of S of uh, this S8 to be uh, something I'm going to call G effective. Okay, and it's given by this formula. U is essentially the same as R up to some alpha prime factors. Um, and so uh, the point is that uh, we have this uh, radius, this um, this thing, which is roughly speaking the square of the radius, and well, which is the square of the radius of uh, S8. And what we see is that when we go to very large U, which is just very large R, uh, this radius becomes very small, right? becomes uh, close to zero. And that's uh, this picture. So this, this uh, picture here somehow says what the radius of S8 is. Okay. Um, very good. And uh, then we can write the other terms in the metric and so on uh, in this way. Um, so again, um, good. Mm. Now, this, uh, so I've pulled out this overall alpha prime, so this, this is really the radius uh, to the fourth, so this combination, well we could take the square root here, this is the radius square of the space, the square of that is, uh, is the, um, oh, one more thing I should say. So um, in this formula, we've, uh, we have here some combination of uh, alpha prime and g-string and so on, which is the g -M, what we, I'm calling the g m mills coupling, or the coupling that appears here in the low energy Lagrangian. So in this low energy limit, we are keeping this fixed, and so that's uh, the final, uh, let's say, coupling or energy scale in the theory. So that energy scale in the theory is appearing in the metric in this way. Um, and um, now, just for comparison, so this this metric has a very similar form for any DP brain. So we could also do a D1 brain, D2 brain, D3 brain, and so on. So in the particular case of the D3 brain that you might be a little bit more familiar with, the, uh, there is no factor here. And these uh, factors here are simply constant. And we have the metric of ADS5 times S5. Um, OK, but due to the fact that uh, this basically tells us what the radius of the space in alpha prime units is, this quantity governs uh, when we can use the gravity approximation. Okay. So we can use, so gravity, uh, gravity is an OK approximation when uh, that uh, G effective of U is much bigger than 1. Okay. So we'll uh, remember that uh, form of the metric. Um, OK, so now you might be used to, uh, and one reason I'm discussing this in detail is to explain how uh, sort of the gauge gravity duality works in cases where you don't have conformal symmetry. So in normally, people talk mostly about the ADS5 times S5 case, where you can take the coupling to be large, and when it's large, it's large everywhere in the space. Um, in this case, uh, what happens is that um, what happens is that um, depending on the value of the <coughs> the radial coordinate, you can have some regions that have a good gravity description and some regions that don't. Okay, so for example, um, here um, there will be so here we can this is just the radial direction, and so when here, g effective is of order 1, right? That's when the radius becomes of order 1 in string units. Um, so then here, to the right of this, we cannot trust the string theory description. But this combination that appears here is also some kind of effective Toft coupling of the matrix model. So if we identify u with an energy scale, um, 
then that's a dimensionful uh, measure of the uh, dimensionless sorry dimensionless measure of the strength of interactions at scale u. So it turns out that uh, so in this region we can use uh, perturbation theory in the matrix model. So perturbation theory is okay, and in this region the gravity theory is okay. Okay. So uh, depending on what phenomenon you are trying to describe in this space time, you might use the gravity description or the perturbation theory description. Right? And the boundary of the space is in this region where uh, you cannot uh, trust the gravity description. Okay. So it's this singular region, so we come back here. So there is um, that boundary is somewhere here, where the size of the S8 is of order 1 in string units. And in this region, we cannot trust this geometry. So this picture is uh, slightly misleading because there is here no geometry. Here there is whatever, the, there is the matrix model. Okay? But the matrix model describes everything. But here the matrix model is particularly easy to analyze. Uh, um, OK, now you might say, well, I'm really worried about this because um, I'm supposed to put boundary conditions at the boundary and so on. And, and now the boundary is singular, so maybe there is nothing I can do. Okay. But there are many things uh, you can do. For example, uh, you could consider a black hole geometry. right? So uh, a black hole geometry is a geometry similar to what we had here. Um, and differs uh, very slightly and can be obtained by looking at the near extremal black holes. So that geometry has here some extra functions of u, h and 1 over h, where h is equal to 1 minus some u0 to the 7th over u to the 7th. Right? So there is one more parameter, u0, which will be related to the temperature of the black hole or to the to the um, black hole mass, and uh, and that parameter would set where the horizon is along the u direction. So let's say that the u zero, so we consider a solution where the u zero is here in the gravity regime, right? Then uh, we can calculate, for example, the entropy of this black hole by calculating the area of the horizon here, and that will give us a good approximation. So even though we, um, on the other hand, if uh, u0 gets uh, very close to here, I mean closer to here, or it's in this regime, we cannot use the gravity description. And the entropy of the black hole will not be given by what we compute using gravity. Okay. So this is a, a general feature of situations where uh, we, have, uh, we have a weakly coupled UV description. This happens for, let's say, the d0 brain, the d1 brain, the d2 brain. We have this, uh, these features. 2 plus 1 YML. So all those theories are free in the ultraviolet, and they have this feature that very close to the boundary you cannot uh, do. I mean, you very close to the boundary, you cannot use the gravity description. Similarly, if you were to calculate correlation functions, so suppose uh, we have the, the time direction, and now here we have the, this u direction. If we are calculating a correlation function, so here we have the dividing line, uh, so that's this dividing line between uh, the, the region where we can trust gravity and where we cannot trust gravity. If we are computing a correlation function at long times, uh, then this correlator is going to be given by some computation. And you might be worried that uh, here, if you think of a geodesic or any wave that is gets emitted from here, it has to pass through this region that is uncalculable. In, right? Well, at least it's not calculable in gravity. You may my calculate it in YAMLs. Um, but the point is that if the times are large, this whole thing that you don't know will be independent of the distance between here and here. Okay. And so the calculation will factorize into a piece that you don't know. And this piece will tell us some relationship between the UV operator in the theory and the, let's say, infrared operator, which translates into a boundary condition for the gravity theory. And that's a problem you would have to solve. And uh, it's, uh, you, 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 in general, you cannot solve it. But in practice. Uh, but you have to think that there will be a problem that in principle is solvable. But the whole details of this problem do not depend on the distance. And then you calculate this correlator by calculate doing a computation in the gravity theory. And in this way, you can uh, compute the correlators. Mm -hmm. um, and th this feature is also present in the, in the SYK model. If you, if you have the original fermion, that was uh, the operator in the, uh, we, we use the same letter, but in principle, there is a, a renormalization group flow and uh, some uh, 
some translation between the UV form of the operator and its infrared form okay, in the infrared theory. Yes? Ah, sorry. It's the, the separation along the time direction, right? So it's this, uh, yeah, I, I may, maybe I should have called it time. Uh, sorry. I was thinking perhaps Euclidean time and, uh, yeah, it's the, the distance, let's say, in Euclidean time or even Lorentzian time. Um, and as I mentioned before, the just in order to make contact with previous discussions, G squared Yam Mills uh, N has units of energy cube in uh, that Lagrangian, so you can check this. So let me. Um, so here, uh, yeah, so you can, uh, because we set this coefficient to 1, um, the, um, the x, uh, we're defining an x which has units of energy. And so this whole thing has units of energy to the fourth, and the, this t cancels one unit, unit of energy, so this n has units of energy cubed. So that morally is uh, g square n is morally to the one third, is morally like the j we had in the SYK, right? And it sets here the time scales over which, uh, uh, which we, where we can trust the uh, gravity versus the other description. Okay. Any questions about this? Uh, I yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So in some in cases when we have supersymmetry and so on, you can use sometimes some tools to give you what the translation between the operators are. So. Um, for example, operators like the stress tensor and so on, they, they have a universal sort of translation between the two sides. And indeed, uh, Mar Mark and uh, Wadi found the expression for the operators. And um, um, yeah, I think that, uh, that expression is probably correct. Uh, Yeah, you, you don't have the conformal symmetry, but uh, you expect that they should have uh, the least number of commutators, for example, and that's part of the principles they they were looking at, and they should realize the supersymmetries. And, um, yeah, so that might not be. So I, I don't know. I don't know whether any check has been done uh, to check that this is the right uh, UV form of the operator. Um, if you do a cal I, I mean, um, of course, one of the issues is what's the normalization between the operator here and the operator. So, so suppose you have the wrong operator here, um, and you, uh, but you do the calculation anyway. Um, it will give you the same as the gravity theory, because all the pieces of the operators that are, let's say, essentially very heavy, very high dimension, effectively go away, and you're really coupling to the gravity mode. So at some level, it doesn't matter too much. I mean, if you are going to the numerical calculation, it doesn't matter too much that you pick the exactly the right operator, as long as it has some overlap with the operator you want. But then you might you, you don't know exactly what the normalization, relative normalization between the operator in gravity and the operator in the field theory. So that uh, is something that um, I'm not sure we are supposed to trust uh, in that case. Uh, in some cases, like operators, as, and, and this is an issue in, 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 in any case, so in any quad four supreme males, in all these cases, it's an issue. Um, and in, in some cases with symmetries, you can really even fix this normalization. Uh, for example, for the stress tensor, we know the normalization. Um, okay, so uh, we can, uh, of course, uh, calculate here the relationship between beta and u0, and we get that uh, this just comes simply from uh, from demanding that the Euclidean solution is regular, uh, so this, the Euclidean time circle is periodic and regular, and that gives uh, a formula for beta, where well, this this g effective of u zero over u zero. Anyway, so there is some formula for beta. It's not not important. What what the precise is the precise form is not important. What is important is that as we change beta, we are, we are the u0 changes, and we are exploring different regions of this solution. Um, OK. Now, there are, there are a few other effects that um, in, in this. So this, this gravity solution is quite rich and has a few different regimes. 
And to talk about the other regimes, it's important that uh, we not only have this metric, but we also have, as we said, an electric field, uh, which uh, whose dual has, um, well, it's along the TNR direction with all flux on, over S8, which is quantized. And also we have um, a dilaton. So, and e to the dilaton uh, behaves like uh, 1 over n. Um, so this is a bulk uh, string coupling times this uh, g effective of u0 to, the, to some power. So it, the half power hap happens to be 7 halves. Now what's important is not the, what the particular power is. What's important is that um, it varies with u0. Okay? So, so we have a 1 over n that we more or less expect that the coupling in the bulk uh, should be small in the large n limit. Okay. Um, but um, the, the actual value of the dilaton depends on this g effective. So g effective is uh, growing as uh, we go to smaller values of u. And there might be, there might be some, uh, some region where the dilaton actually becomes large. Right? That region is, of course, a place that is independent. And so there will be some, uh, some place when, um, when, uh, when this becomes a further one. So here, when g effective to the 7 halves is equal to n, right? So that's uh, g effective um, equal to n to the 2 seventh, right? Um, that's a region where this uh, type 2a gravity description or string theory description would uh, break down. And we will, if we go beyond that, we have to go to M theory, OK? So there is then uh, an M theory regime also in this, in this model. And if we, um, so the M theory picture um, looks like um, the M theory picture. Um, when we lift this to M theory, there is now an 11th direction. I won't do it explicitly, but there is a metric that we can get this from lifting this metric to 11 dimensions. So there's an 11 dimensional metric with one more coordinate. And the black hole is translational invariant in that 11th direction. So if we, that 11th direction is compact. So this is the 11th direction. This is somehow the radial direction. And we have a black hole uh, that looks really like a black string in uh, 11 dimensions. Right? And if you continue uh, going here to uh, lower and lower values of u, I'm, I'm running out of blackboard here. Should have uh, predicted this. Um, <laughs> um, it reaches a point when this black hole becomes uh, can become localized. Um, so you have a transition of this kind, where the black hole becomes really an 11th dimension, 11th dimensional black hole, and that happens when um, g effective is uh, it's n to the, it, the the powers don't matter. The, what, well, the, mat, the, the powers matter if you want to do something in detail. Um, what matters is that um, uh, they are independent, um, and well, they, for large n, they are this one comes uh, after this one, um, and then you can continue going to lower and lower energies. And if the temperature, so you can think of uh, decreasing the temperature, and it reaches a point when the black hole at sufficiently um, well, it, it, this black hole could be sufficiently small that uh, we are reaching the Planck scale. So for th in that regime, actually, we are raising the temperature. But that's a value of u where uh, you have to go back to somehow the graviton description. So the, even the 11-dimensional supergravity description breaks down. Um, now, one uh, important point here is that uh, this, uh, this whole range uh, exist only for large n. So if n was small, this whole thing collapses, and we don't have any of these regions. So we go from the perturbative description to something uh, more complicated. And, um, it, we, we do not uh, explore this whole gravity region and m theory region and so on. Okay. So those only exist for large n. Yes. Oh, yes, I didn't, I didn't emphasize that. So this is an 11th dimensional uh, solution. Um, and then, uh, because we have charge, uh, this has some momentum in the 11th dimension. So here, yeah, I skipped one step, sorry. Um, so we can generate this solution by taking a black string of this form, and then we boost the black string, and we get the solution we want. We could also get a similar solution by boosting a black hole, taking one of these black holes and making it move along the 11th dimension. And uh, then we also recover uh, the solution. Um, 
Now, when you have, for example, a situation like this, the, the actual physical size of the 11th dimension, um, because it's moving in the 11th dimension, it, this, this motion tends to blow up the size of the 11th dimension. And the physical size of the 11th dimension looks uh, something like this. Uh, it's a cartoon for what the size is. So here is when the size becomes very small. That's uh, this transition region where we, um, we go from the M3 regime to the type 2A regime and so on. Right? Um, now, um, so you can use this, uh, and, and so okay, in this in this regime, uh, you you have a little bit of a bubble which looks like 11-dimensional uh, flat space with objects that have been highly boosted. Okay, and so you can use this matrix model also to uh, study 11-dimensional M theory. So BFSS, uh, Banks, uh, Fischler, Saskin, and, and Schenker. Um, have uh, proposed to use this matrix model in this regime at very low energies to study uh, gravitational physics in 11 dimension. So that's another application of this uh, matrix model. And that, uh, in order to do that, you need to scale the energies uh, to be low enough, so with some power of n, so that you make sure you are in uh, here in the M this M theory regime with localized objects. Okay. Okay. I want um, any questions. Um, okay, so that's uh, the picture um, uh, with this matrix model. You, I mean, that, that the whole picture I, I mentioned was when the case when mu was equal to zero. So you can turn on a non-zero mu, and depending on the value of mu, um, you have different physics. So if uh, mu is such, so you can define if, if mu is very large, then the space somehow ends here, and we have just a completely perturbative description. As you make uh, mu uh, smaller, you have a, sp a space that somehow ends. I'm, I'm not going to describe the details of the solution, but somehow ends at some finite radial position. And that finite radial position moves uh, deeper, deeper and deeper inside as mu gets smaller. Okay. So, um, yeah, you can also consider this. Yeah, yes? This, uh, yes. Right, so th th there is very strongly coupled. So here it's, uh, so you go to really strongly coupled, and well, if you are infinitely powerful, you can solve it and you learn about M theory. Okay? Yeah, yeah, this is outside the top scaling. Yeah, so the, yeah, maybe I should have said that. So the top scaling corresponds to taking n to infinity, right, and keeping the top coupling fixed. So this is uh, somehow the, the top coupling. Now the top coupling is dimensionful, but let's say what the, the top limit in this regime, in this uh, model, corresponds to saying that, well, we keep this energy scale of where the coupling becomes a further one fixed, and then we're going to explore energies which are fixed in the n, n equal to infinity limit. So that pushes this, this, these things all the way to zero, and then the model really has only two regimes, the perturbative regime and this, uh, this supergravity regime. Okay? And it's a model that, uh, where the strings are free, so as you expect in the, in the Toft model. So the dilaton it goes to zero. Um, Okay, so now um, let's ask a question, which I think you have been discussing, uh, which is where the brains are. Okay. So first, uh, let's uh, let's confuse us our let's confuse ourselves a little bit. Um, so we have this picture, right? So we started with this picture, and we took this uh, kind of limit where uh, the solution becomes uh, kind of singular and. We have a picture roughly like this. There is some flat space with uh, some objects here. Okay. From the flat space people, brains are here. Okay. That's one. Um, now, the question is from this bulk uh, people, where are the brains? Uh, now, notice that when we, let me just point one thing out, which is that we had this function f uh, that was 1 over r to the 7, was had some, something like n over r to the 7. I mean, or another irrelevant constant here. Now we could write another solution that where f is replaced by uh, sum over i of 1 over r minus ri to the 7th, right? And so this looks like a bunch of brains on top of each other, and this looks like a bunch of brains all separated from each other, okay? And we can take this in such a way that we are still in the, um, in the near horizon region, so we have dropped the one here. So this is also a solution 
with the same asymptotic boundary conditions, large R asymptotic boundary conditions, as the one we were discussing, right? So this is some other state of uh, this matrix model. And indeed, we can uh, understand this state by saying that we are taking the matrices X and we are, uh, let's say, diagonalizing them. And we put, so this X has some vector, there are nine of these matrices. Um, and let's say we take uh, the matrices X to have uh, R1 uh, up to Rn, okay? And zeros everywhere in the diagonal. So if we take such matrices, well, with, which all commute with each other, the potential term, the, co the double commutate, the commutator term here, so this term here, would, um, would be zero, and that's a zero energy configuration, right? Okay, so we see this uh, solution also in the matrix model. And so from this point of view, it looks uh, like the brains maybe are, are equal to zero, okay? Um, on the other hand, uh, the um, anything that happens uh, in this space can be described from the matrix model, right? Um, so there, that, there it looks like uh, the brains should be everywhere, right? So the more proper answer is, uh, and, and if you are confused thinking about this question, uh, you, you, we have been confused about this before. So. Uh, when we first started thinking about deep brains and black holes, we were quite confused about where the brains were. Uh, and um, the, the answer, I think, is that uh, we need to understand what brains are. So um, when we think about the brains, we can have different things in mind. So the, the, the word uh, does not denote the whole uh, conceptual subtlety of what it is. So if we think of the brain as uh, the space on, or the place where the SUN Young Mills theory lives, right? Um, that space uh, from the 11 in 10 dimensions is, is located here at the center of uh, R9. Um, and, and that space has a geometry which is the geometry of the boundary of the gravity solution. And the this whole matrix theory, when we integrate over the matrices and consider arbitrary states, is describing the whole uh, gravity solution, right? Um, it's describing the whole gravity solution, uh, so this whole uh, region, or this whole space, the conical space here. Um, on the other hand, there are these other objects, um, which uh, look like brains in the bulk. So here, uh, I, something I didn't say is that when you consider this type of solution, so in particular, let me first uh, consider a simpler example, more controlled example would be to say that we take uh, n minus 1, we leave it uh, at r equal to 0, and then we pull just uh, one of them out. Uh, and this uh, has the, the form of a gravity solution with an additional brain in the, in the infrared. So that looks like uh, this, uh, this cone. And then there, in addition, there is some brain that is located uh, somewhere along this cone, right? It's at some point on the sphere and some point in the radial direction. Um, now, the idea is that uh, this, uh, this object is some particular uh, state of the matrix model, uh, which is analogous to a state where we put, let's say, we pull out, we, at weak coupling it would be a state where we just uh, set R here and give a web to the matrices which is zero everywhere. So that would be a good description. So this description here is uh, reasonable. Well, when the brain is very close to the tip that we can neglect all other corrections. But when the brain is in the gravity region, there is some, uh, some correspondence between these two, but it's quite non-trivial. So this, um, this variable R that appears here is uh, some kind of infrared variable, which is not directly related to the eigenvalues of the matrix, okay? So we'll now uh, compute the eigenvalues of the matrix, um, and we are going to try to find the typical eigenvalues of the matrix. Um, so, uh, let me see which blackboard should I use. Um, okay, let's use this one. So now what we're going to try to understand is what are the typical eigenvalues of the matrices. Um, so let's say that we have 
uh, the ground state wave function. So this, uh, I didn't mention, but this matrix, well, or, yeah. So let's say we put a very tiny mass term, or even with zero mass term, there is some ground state wave function. And we are going to try to, est try to estimate the uh, typical eigenvalue. And one way we can estimate it, um, or we will just, this will be our definition for what we mean by the typical eigenvalue. We just take one of the matrices, let's say x1, um, and we take the square, and we calculate the trace, right? So if we were to diagonalize x1, this would be just the sum of all eigenvalues squared, right? And then we are just taking the average, so 1 over n. So this is, uh, by definition, what we mean by, let's say, the average eigenvalue. So this is roughly like the size of this uh, object, OK? This OK, so um, it turns out that uh, I'm, I'm going to give you a heuristic argument in a second, um, that this size is uh, roughly of uh, the order of uh, G Young Mills is equal to this scale uh, that uh, we had defined, right? So th there was this energy scale of the model, which was a cube, right? R roughly like k cubed. In the, uh, so this guy's well, maybe I should draw it like this. Uh, one third. So this is uh, an energy scale. Um, and the typical size of the matrices, the matrices, remember, we were defining them so that they have dimensions of energy. Uh, they uh, have this uh, typical size, okay? Uh, so, in particular, strong coupling, they have very big size. And so this R is also, if, if we were to diagonalize the D brains, would be essentially like the position in the U direction of where the brains are, right? So it's telling us that the typical size is uh, some position here. I mean, we can make a translation between this R and some position. And the typical position is not somewhere deep in the, mi in the middle, right? It's actually here, okay? So what remember yeah I, I should pull out pull up this blackboard uh, remember so this u is roughly like well it's uh, essentially the radial position so if we get an u which is of order uh, u cubed which is of order g and mills n we have this g square effective which is of order one and that corresponds precisely to this region okay so what this is saying is that in this ground state wave function, all these matrices are fluctuating, uh, quantum mechanically, and so on. And they have very big, uh, very big fluctuations. They are fluctuations which, are, which span the whole gravity description. Um, OK. Um, <laughs> Uh, no, no, this is, um, um, no, because these are not the fluctuations of the, yeah, in quantum field theory, it's even worse. So in quantum field theory, um, at very short distances, the uh, the fields have very large fluctuations. Um, and a similar calculation for trying to calculate the, the, the field at one particular instant in space and time will give us infinity, right? So uh, we, we'll get inf we would get infinity in quantum field theory. But uh, in, the, in quantum mechanics, uh, this operator trace x1 squared is a perfectly well-defined operator and has some BEV on this vacuum, and that we can definitely use it to define the, the size, right? And gives us the, the range of fluctuation. So if we think about the wave function for the x coordinate, um, the, the wave function is extended over this whole region. Right? Um, so it's like when we have a harmonic oscillator, we have a wave function which has some size, right? Some typical size of the Gaussian. So if we think about the eigenvalues, the eigenvalues of the matrix X1 also have some wave function. Um, and this wave function is extended over the whole uh, gravity region. Yeah. Yeah, G effective of order one was the boundary of uh, the gravity region. So it's not r equal to 0. It's here, right? No, it does not go to, yeah, I mean, the whole range of the gravity where we can trust gravity. It doesn't go into the perturbative regime. That's true. It's in the boundary of the perturbative regime. 
So in order somehow to get to the perturbative regime, you need to take one of these brains and separate it by more than the typical eigenvalues of the matrices, right? If you separate it by more than that, then uh, we can trust the perturbative regime. Okay, so let me give you uh, a quick uh, argument for this. And this argument was, uh, well, a, a more precise argument was given by Joe Polchinski. Um, and so the, the argument is uh, roughly the following. So um, let's, uh, so this is x1. So let's say, let's say let, I'm, I'm not going to assume this now. So uh, that was the final result. So let me try to uh, justify this. Um, so let's say that the typical uh, spreading of eigenvalues is r squared, right? And let's say when we diagonalize x1, right? And so we'll have, um, well, we have a bunch of eigenvalues uh, spread over, um, over a size r squared. So now let's consider the matrix x2, OK? So, so this is not the square of a matrix, but the index 2, OK? Um, now this matrix uh, contains that term. So there is a, it's a bunch of harmonic oscillators, x dot square. Let me call it y, the second. L let me take x2, let me call it y, just not to confuse. Uh, so we have a term in the, uh, and then this, the, let's call this one x. So we have y dot squared plus uh, x commutator y squared in the Lagrangian, right? So we have a Lagrangian like this. Um, and for each, so now um, we, let's say, diagonalize the matrix x. Um, and then this term in the Lagrangian, so this is an off-diagonal, this is some general matrix with i and j indices. And this term becomes um, xi minus xj squared times uh, yij squared. So the typical of diagonal term has a, a matrix, so it, has a, has, it looks like a harmonic oscillator with a mass which is proportional to the, um, to the difference in eigenvalues. This you might have seen when people talk about d-brains and you separate two d-brains. Uh, the open strings that go between the d-brains are, are massive and they have a mass proportional to the distance. But this, the typical value of this is of order r squared, okay? So now let's think about the wave functional, the wave function of each of these harmonic oscillators, right? So each of these harmonic oscillators will have some wave function, which is a function of this y-coordinate. Um, so this is like the frequency of the harmonic oscillator. And um, the wave function um, will be a Gaussian, right? So it will be go like e to the minus y squared. And what we would like to find, this is for each component, goes like this. And we like to find the typical uh, spreading, right? So we could uh, define a y tilde, which is y over g, uh, m -ls, right? So in terms of the y tilde variable, uh, it's just a Gaussian with uh, this uh, frequency. And uh, in order to obey the harmonic oscillator equations, we need that uh, the frequency appears in this way, so that when we take two derivatives, we get the y squared times omega squared. Right? And th this was R. So this is R. So that's the typical um, spreading. OK. OK, fine. So we found the wave function for all the, so the full wave function in this very naive approximation is just the product uh, over all i and j's of this type of wave function. So let's now calculate the trace of uh, y squared, right? So this trace of y squared. Um, will uh, go like uh, 1 over r, because that's the uh, spreading here, the, the, the variation, the spreading of y squared. And then uh, we have, of course, when we take the trace, we have n squared components, right? Um, and then we need to remember we normalized uh, this variable um, in uh, some, well, we, we, this was the spreading in y tilde, so we y g m l squared. OK, and so now uh, we say, well, we have, we take the average of this. So that comes as one factor of n. And this was just the matrix y2 squared, given the assumption that the matrix, let's say, y1 had spread in R. Right? But y1 and y2 are equivalent in this Lagrangian, so they should both have the same spreading. So we should equate this to R squared. Right? And then this gives the equation that we wanted to derive, that uh, R, R cubed goes like uh, gm mills n. Okay. This is just a rough uh, idea that at least shows a bit the essential physics of, of what's going on, that uh, 
we have all these things are quantum mechanical and the quantum mechanical spread of the, all these massive oscillators is contributing to the spread of the eigenvalues. Um, okay, so the, so the matrix are... Now, there are some people that have done uh, some computations using localization, supersymmetric localization, and uh, they've, uh, so in particular, Asano, Ishiki, Shimashi, and Terashima, so they've done some calculations uh, using some techniques of supersymmetric localization in this matrix model. And they have found, they managed to calculate exactly the um, correlators of uh, some particular fields, C to the K, where C is uh, roughly X uh, plus I, Y. Okay? So combinations of two of the matrices, okay? complex combinations. And they have found that these uh, correlators have very small uh, eigenvalue. So the spreading of this correlator, so you can calculate all these powers, and from this you can calculate the eigenvalue distribution. And those eigenvalue distributions uh, for those complex matrices are very small. Okay? Um, but the eigenvalues of the matrix C is not the same as the eigenvalues of X and Y. Right? So you have lots of fluctuations in X, lots of fluctuations in Y, and they are somehow cancelling and conspiring to give you uh, small fluctuations in these coordinates. This is just an example that, th th well, this is a manifestation of the fact that these this fluctuating eigenvalues are highly correlated. So we have some wave function where they are not two independent uh, uh, Gaussian, uh, Gaussianly distributed variables, but they are highly correlated. Um, and, of course, uh, we expect something like that in order to give rise to the gravity solution that... Uh, this, all these features and structures of the gravity solution uh, have to do with the correlations that we have in the in this ground state uh, wave function. And well, the gravity computation is uh, takes all that into. I mean, um, yeah. So, I, I, yeah, I, I want to emphasize. Yeah, I think in order to answer your question a little more. Is that, that spreading is unrelated to the spreading of this RI position. So it doesn't mean that the brains come out from the bottom and so on, right? This meaning of brains. So this, this RI is some kind of integral over time of X, and then you calculate the eigenvalue. So roughly speaking, that's what it is. So you are integrating, you are integrating the matrix. Roughly speaking, it's an observable where you integrate over some, um, over some time the matrix X, and then you calculate the eigenvalue. So it's some kind of average eigenvalue in this sense. So you are averaging over short time fluctuations, and you are calculating the mean, uh, the mean, ex well, you are diagonalizing after you've uh, done this average. Okay, that's what uh, this type of observable roughly would mean. So, and those, uh, yeah, have small fluctuations in the gravity regime. They are very deep down, and they are not coming out, out from the bottom. Uh, now there are some calculations for which this, uh, these are relevant. So, for example. We briefly, I mean, we discussed the, uh, the finite temperature solution. And this finite temperature solution in the original uh, matrix model without the masses um, is uh, strictly speaking unstable because um, we can, this uh, black hole can emit a D0 brain, uh, and this D0 brain then can go to infinity, and eventually all the D0 brains will go to infinity, and the black hole would have disappeared. But this is a very slow process that is exponentially suppressed, uh, especially when we are in those gravity regimes and for large n and so on. And but well, in principle, it needs to be taken into account. It's an example of uh, something that can happen. Yeah, that one is absent. Yeah, that's right. Because there you you would need uh, an infinite action to move the whole brain. But if you were to put the three, these three brains on a torus, for example, in a spatial torus, then you would also have this instability. But it's not an important, I mean, it's some feature, but it's not important and it, uh, it doesn't matter that the black hole is strictly stable or, uh, or unstable for some questions. I mean, to calculate the, its, its entropy, for example, you can define it in both cases. Um, and, and for some purposes, you might want to, you might like the fact that it's unstable. So, for example, if you want to study the the evaporation of a Schwarzschild black hole in 11 dimensions, then this black hole will start emitting particles, and these particles then carry some momentum in the 11 dimension and will manifest themselves in the zero brains that are moving out. Right? And in this way, you could calculate the Hawking radiation from that black hole, and for that purpose, it's useful that these brains uh, go to infinity. 
because the final states are all these brains moving to infinity that is well described by perturbation theory in the matrix model and from there you can calculate the scattering amplitude in 11 dimensions. Um, okay. So now I... Um, okay, and usually I, I went a little faster today. Let's, um, now I'll, uh, I'll discuss uh, a bit more the aspects of the thermodynamics of this uh, of these black holes. Yeah. Yes. Uh, what's your picture for the eigenvectors in the matrix? So it doesn't drop out of every term, right? Um, yeah. So the the idea. So if if you just start with one of the matrices and diagonalize only one. You can do that by gauge transformation. So those again vectors don't have any physical meaning. But yeah. So then, then, then that that those are well defined only when they all commute. So, um, so those are well defined when we are looking at vacua. So, if we, we can only diagonalize all the matrices if we are looking at the space of vacua where of zero energy configurations perturbative in this matrix model where we set to zero the uh, potential. And then they all diagonalize. We can diagonalize them, and the, eigen the eigenvectors have no meaning. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. Well, now that I'm at it, yeah. Well, maybe I won't comment. Yeah. Yes. It's not constant. Yeah. So the dilaton field varies with u zero. So there is g effect. Oh, so sorry. I uh, that shouldn't have been a u zero. Sorry, I mean my mistake. OK, so this might have been an understandable. Um, sorry, that's why I should have written it beforehand, so not to make this mistake. The dilaton field depends on you, um, and that's why we had, uh, uh, that's why we had this, uh, various regi this transition regime, for example. So the gravity solution is valid up to here, and then deeper inside is not valid, right? Yeah. Yeah, that, that, that's the dilaton. The, the dilaton is independent of the u0, so now it's uh, correct. I think I, I might have made some other mistake. But for any u0 uh, within this decoupling regime, this is the profile for the dilaton. Um. OK. Mm. Now, so now what we would like to do is to use the gravity solution. So I'm going to give you. Uh, an so we, we are going to use this to calculate the free energy of that uh, matrix model, right? So we're going to put it at finite temperature and then calculate uh, the free energy as a function of beta or as a function of the temperature. So uh, to do that, we uh, start with this uh, metric, the metric of the black hole. We, um, let's say, know beta, so we we from this formula, we calculate u0, and so we know exactly which uh, metric we are supposed to use here. And then we put it uh, back into the action. And uh, in the action, in the gravity action, we have uh, a term in that goes like e to the minus 2 phi times this uh, string frame metric, and a bunch of other terms. But all other terms will scale in the same way as the one that I'm talking about. So we can. Uh, Evaluate these terms, and the first term will give something like uh, n squared. Um, there is an n squared coming from here, from inverting that e to the phi. And then there are a bunch of uh, factors of g effective of u. Of u. Now it will be evaluated all essentially at u0. And, um, and well, you compute them from these terms, and you end up having something. Um, so you end up having something that goes like uh, g effective to the minus 3, OK? So that's, uh, that's uh, the form of the action. And you can calculate that as, as a function of the temperature. Um, and you get some particular powers of the temperature. Uh, so n squared times uh, beta to the minus uh, 14 over 5, for example. So some funny powers like this. Um, the, the, the essential one, one point I would not like to emphasize, I won't, I won't, derive, it. I won't derive this, but uh, I just try to emphasize it is that um, this uh, this whole uh, this problem um, has a, a scaling symmetry. So this metric is not ADS. Um, however, if you rescale u, um, you can rescale u up to rescaling. So so the metric is not invariant, and that that rescaling 
and it picks up an overall factor. And so, um, and that overall factor also rescales the action. But that rescaling is a symmetry of the equations of motion. So we have a symmetry of the equations of motion, which is not the symmetry of the action. Right? There, there are these virial symmetries that are like this that uh, are also used in other contexts. But so that symmetry essentially determines this uh, power of the temperature. So it might look funny here, but when you think through this symmetry, uh, sometimes called hyperscaling symmetry, um, uh, it determines this uh, power of the temperature. Um, so if you do any other problem that has the same symmetry, you will also reproduce this temperature. So for example, people have um, thought about trying to reproduce this from a gas of uh, deep, well, maybe I should. Okay. So if, you, if, you're, if you're trying to predict, yeah. I won't talk that. Um, so let's keep focused. Uh, we could calculate the energy from, so this is the, the scaling of the action or the entropy or the free energy of beta f. Um, if we want to calculate the energy, we have to uh, divide by, beta, well, take the derivative with respect to beta, so that gives one less power. Um, and, um, oh, I wrote the wrong power here. This is minus three. Um, and uh, so by the time you are done, the power in the energy ends up being temperature to the 14 over 5, okay? Some power, okay? But it's determined by simply uh, following through these uh, scaling arguments. So that's the leading power, um, and there is an overall n square here. Um, now, it will be important for what we are going to discuss to uh, include some alpha prime corrections. So there will, this is one plus some alpha prime corrections. So let's try to understand the structure of these alpha prime corrections. Now it turns out that in 10 dimensional supergravity, the first alpha prime correction is a term alpha prime cube times uh, r to the fourth. Okay? So that's in gravity, and then this term is completed to a bunch of other terms involving f2 powers and so on, whose precise completion is uh, not known. Okay? But uh, unfortunately, it's not known. But what is known is that uh, we here should have a term that goes like alpha prime um, cube. And then uh, this uh, expansion in powers of alpha prime is essentially an, ex an expansion in powers of, uh, of the inverse of this. So we have, let's take the square root of this, three effective um, r square, right? So we have a term that goes like alpha prime cube. It goes like one over g effective to the third, right? And then we use the relationship between g effective and the temperature that we can get from this formula. And so that translates into uh, the statement that this, um, these terms that go like um, alpha prime, essentially each factor of alpha prime is, um, well, comes with the size of the space. Um, which, uh, well, so the L, the size of the space at the scale of the temperature or at the horizon, let's say, and this goes like, um, ends up going like temperature to the three-fifth, okay? So there is some other power that you can similarly simply uh, obtain. And so, um, so we know that the expansion has an alpha prime cube over L, uh, well, to the corresponding power. Um, and then it turns out that the next correction, so there is, in principle, you could have a correction alpha prime to the fourth, but that turns out to be absent. Uh, people have analyzed these corrections in ten flat 10 dimensions. And the next correction goes like alpha prime to the fifth, and then, the, then now you have alpha prime to the sixth, and so on. Right? So this pattern uh, then gives you here um, a pattern of powers that you could uh, have. So now this will be to the fifth, and then alpha prime over L squared to the sixth, and so on. Right? So this ends up being um, a bunch of powers of the temperature. So let's say n squared t to the 14 over 5. And then there are particular powers that of the temperature that are determined by putting these powers in this expansion. Okay. So you put those powers. So you have this power, but I'm, I'm not, yeah, maybe, I, maybe I will. So, so the full gravity expression is some coefficient which we will call a0. And then some coefficient, which we call a1, the next power turns out to be, so I'm just going to give the 23 over 5, and then we have a2, uh, 29 over 5, and then we could have like an a3, uh, 32 over 5, and so on. Okay. 
Good. So uh, that's uh, what uh, we expect in from gravity. And the only thing that we know from gravity is the coefficient a0. So the, the, the coefficients a1 and a2 are, in principle, calculable, uh, but we don't know what the actual values are. Uh, because we don't know the full form of those r to the fourth corrections, including the higher powers of f of the electric field. Um, OK, so there is a bunch of people who have been, through the years, uh, doing numerical calculations in the matrix model in order to reproduce this free energy. And this is an interesting case because uh, this is an example of an entropy that is not determined by some symmetries. So for example, the successful matches between ADS, between gravity and field theory, have always been um, using, for, for non-extremal black holes, have always involved um, the Cardi formula, or ADS3 situations. Um, so where the, the whole thing is determined by the symmetries, the central charge, and so on. And so this is an example where uh, the computation is not determined by the symmetries. And it's also uh, quantum mechanics theory, which in principle, uh, one should be able to simulate. That's in principle, but it's co quite difficult. And so people have uh, worked on this uh, for a while. And here I'm going to present the results of the, some of the latest simulations that were done by Berkowitz, uh, Rinaldi, Hanada, Ishiki, and Shimi Shimasaki. And uh, what they found is the following. So they calculated E divided by N squared and as a function of the temperature in units of, uh, so they've, they've set the G effective N to, to be one, right? So they measure the temperature in some dimensionless units. So that, um, and here uh, we can draw the gravity answer. So the gravity answer will be this A0 times T to the 14 over five. So it's some, some curve here, okay? That's uh, the gravity answer. And then they compute it for various temperatures. So for example, for temperature 0.4, uh, they find some result here, some, uh, some point here. Then they've computed for some other temperatures. And they found uh, something roughly like this. OK? Anyway, some, some, with some error bars, which are actually smaller than what I've drawn them. So I I'm not doing justice to their plot. Um, you can come and look at the plot here later if you want. Um, OK, so um, now they, so you see from here that uh, the results have not yet completely converged to the gravity answer, right? So, uh, but it is more difficult for them to go to lower temperatures. It's harder uh, numerically. And we expect it because we, we've said that there are all these correlations and blah, blah, blah. And so it will be tougher to go to this regime. And indeed, that's what they find. Um, but what they've done is they, they said, well, let's assume that we have these corrections and that we don't know those coefficients. We don't know A0, 1, A2, and let's say we don't know A0 either, OK? And we, we fit the curve of that form through all these points, OK? So they, they have a best fit curve, which is of this form. And uh, they determine this way those four coefficients, OK? And then uh, they find that, uh, so the coefficient uh, A0 determined numerically in this way, so numerically. Uh, minus the A0 from uh, gravity, right? Um, differs from the A0 from gravity by roughly uh, 7%, okay? So it's kind of, this is within, this is the numerical error that they get. This is not the disagreement, but just the numerical error that they get here, the 7%, yeah. Well, the, the dimension of the silver space is 2 to the 8n squared. So what kind of ends are they doing? Yeah, so the dimension of the Hilbert space in this model is infinite because we have uh, bosonic harmonic oscillators. But the ends they are doing are roughly 16 uh, or, so they, they're not, not particularly large. So they, they are not, they're not quantizing. So it's different than the, um, people have done numerical simulations of SYK where they exactly diagonalize the Hamiltonian, right? Um, that's not what they are doing. They are not taking this Hamiltonian and trying to diagonalize it and then calculate the free energy. What uh, they are doing is they are starting from the path integral formulation in Euclidean space um, and then applying the standard methods of lat lattice gauge theory to uh, calculate this. And um, the calculation of that, uh, of that function, of that Euclidean path integral is a bit tricky. Um, and 
in particular because there is a fermion determinant. So let me just mention this. So this is a general feature of uh, QCD computations. Um, um, so if you have fermions, uh, you will need to. Um, so no notice the fermions appear quadratically, right? So you, you can integrate out the fermions. So you have some path integral that involves an axis and fermions. And determine the fermions is quadratic, so we'll have a determinant, a determinant of something like, uh, well, I omega, let's say, or dt, so this is the kinetic term, and then there, is, uh, there are all these axes, right? Um, now it turns out that, uh, more precisely, it's a Fafian uh, of uh, this object. And this uh, Fafian um, ends up being uh, complex. So there's this operator here. It's not Hermitian, and it's not positive, and so on. You can have, uh, in general, complex eigenvalues. Okay? And so that's uh, that. Um, now, if this had been real and positive, uh, then we could um, then we could do the path integral using Monte Carlo methods. Okay. Now, what they have done, and this is a, usually when this is complex and so on, it's it's tricky and it's more difficult to do the numerical uh, computations. But in this particular model, they have uh, first calculated the model as you put in a modulus here, right? Um, and then they went back to the configurations that were dominating the path integral and calculated the thing, calculated the actual Fafian without the modulus. And they found that the value is close to one, the <coughs> that the phase, oh, sorry, that the phase is uh, close to zero. So that this is, uh, at least in that regime, is more or less positive. Um, so that's a consistency check that uh, that this, um, well, for, for those results. So the results are done, uh, they, they, they were all done putting a modulus here. And then they went back and checked that, at least for the dominant configurations, the phase was close to 1. And of course, in the subdominant configurations, the phase could be not uh, equal to 1, but then it, it would only suppress the, uh, those, those contributions. Um, OK, so that's, uh, that's that. And I think I'm essentially finished. I, um, so there is an exercise here that. Uh, the, this numerical people have given us, which is to calculate a1 and a2. <laughs> um, um, so numerics is uh, is more advanced than uh, than, than analytic calculations. Um, okay, so I think I'll finish early and two minutes early and answer questions. Yeah, they use the exact powers that you expect. Yeah. Well, th there are different fits. They, th some some fits use different power. There are lots of different. You, you, if you look at the papers, you'll find uh, different types of fits. I, I described the one that uh, looks nicer. Yeah, so what you would do is, so you, you know the coefficient of r to the fourth, and then you would need to supersymmetrize. So one, one method would be to supersymmetrize the whole, uh, the whole term. So the, let, me, let me say a little bit where the, the issue lies. Um, so r to the fourth is a term with eight derivatives, right? So the full complete thing is all possible, but uh, that could, in principle, appear are all possible terms that have eight derivatives. So something like f, for example, has uh, one derivative. So you can have terms of the form f to the eight. Uh, you can have terms uh, with a bunch of derivatives of the dilaton and f, I don't know, square uh, to the six and so on. So you have a bunch of terms of this form. So all the terms for this calculation, all the terms you care about are the ones that involve f, so the, the electric field and uh, the, the dilaton, right? If you manage to get all these terms, then you would be in business. Um, and so that's uh, what uh, needs to, in principle, be done. Uh, I should mention that there is one correction here. Um, that so there is, uh, there of course, there, there is a term of order one. So there is n squared, and then there are terms that are independent of n. And there is, again, some contribution from 
an R to the fourth correction, which uh, do dominates, uh, which is important here. And this um, R to the fourth correction, uh, so the one loop term can, can be uh, completed because you can lift this up to M theory, and then in M theory, all these uh, various terms come from uh, supersymmetry. But uh, th that's the one loop correction that has a different overall uh, dilaton dependence here. Um, and to supersymmetrize this one seems a different problem. And as far as I know, has not been done. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, well, uh, th there is a general question, which is, uh, which is actually an in interesting conceptual problem, um, conceptually conceptual point. That uh, l let me just say it in general. So, um, let's say we have n equal to four super young males, right? And then, um, then the the effective action. Or, or any calculation for the partition function, the full path, path integral, and so on, uh, has terms of order n squared, right? And then it has terms of order one, and then there is this whole alpha prime expansion that we've uh, been discussing, right? Terms of order one over square root of lambda to the three, that's the first term, and then there is a sim similar expansion we discussed here. Now, uh, let's say we talk, talk about the terms of order one. What do you think is going to be the, the form of this term? So order one in n, so n to the zero. What do you think is going to be the lambda behavior be dependence of these guys? Now let's let's think a little bit. Well, okay, maybe uh, maybe I, I should. Uh, if if you if you take uh, if you take type two b supergravity, right? Um, after you rescale n and r and so on. The type 2b supergravity terms are all independent of alpha prime or independent of lambda. They only depend on n. So roughly n is like L Planck in 11 dimensions, in 10 dimensions, related to L Planck in 10 dimensions. And so they only depend on n. So any calculation that you do using gravity will give you answers that do not depend explicitly on alpha prime. Right? And then these other are some <coughs> corrections that for large alpha prime are classic, uh, they are suppressed in the classical theory, right? the, the leading n answer. Now, so naively you would say, uh, I do some. Uh, if I if I have to calculate this term, this term would come from calculating. For example, you take the gravity solution and you calculate the determinant of the fields. I mean, you calculate small fluctuations of all fields around the configuration. Right? Let's say it's a black hole. Then around the black hole configuration, you calculate the determinant, and that does not involve alpha prime. At least the gravity action does not depend on, depend on alpha prime. And so you would expect that that should give you some answer, which uh, goes like one, some term of order one, and then there might be some <coughs> alpha prime corrections, right? Square root of lambda plus blah, 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 right? Um, however, we are forgetting some very important point, which is that 10 dimensional supergravity is UV divergent, okay? And um, the, for the, the, the first UV divergence of 10 dimensional supergravity. Um, so na naively, you would think that the, you have divergences of the cosmological constant and the, uh, you know, the Einstein term and so on. Um, but it turns out that the first correction uh, is an R to the fourth term similar to what we are, well, it's actually not the three level one, but the one loop one, independent of the dilaton. And that, uh, that term is quadratically divergent. And in, uh, of course, in full string theory, that quadratic divergence is cut off, but it's cut off at scale alpha prime. Um, so this implies that there is here uh, a big term that is of order uh, square root of lambda that uh, comes from the UV divergences of the gravity theory. And so it comes from this local term. So a nice feature is that this term can be computed without doing an actual loop calculation in, uh, in the bulk, a complicated loop calculation. You can just do once and for all the loop calculation in flat space, determine the coefficient of the R to the fourth term in flat space, the counter term in flat space, and then uh, you just simply um, you just simply evaluate that on your background, and that gives you the leading term here. Um, okay. yeah. Any other questions or comments? Yeah. Can you instead get more of these alpha prime corrections? Yes, you can get the, the ones that come. Uh, you can get the ones that are of order n to the zero. Right? 
because there, uh, for those, the, the, the structure of the term and the, the structure of the supersymmetries are the same as the ones that were in 11, in 11 dimension. But uh, these other ones you cannot get from 11 dimensions. I mean, uh, uh, naive, uh, well, for first of all, let me just make a general point. In general, if you are trying to calculate the low energy effective action in 11 dimensions, so you calculate it in 11 dimensions, but then if you reduce to 10 dimensions, it, it's incorrect to take that ca that action, low energy effective action you took in in 11 dimensions, and then dimensionally reducing it to 10 dimensions. And it's incorrect because the you, you, one of the sides of your space is, well, the, in order to go to 10 dimensions, you have to take one circle to be very, very tiny, right? And uh, because it's very tiny, the, the, the effective action in 10 dimensions could be different than the one that, different than the dimensional reduction of the one in uh, 11 dimensions. That, that's true for any effective action for any system. Uh, now, often people get the right answers by doing a naive uh, dimensional reduction. This, of course, uh, doesn't work in general, uh, but it works for some terms. And it works for, typically works for those terms that whose structure is determined by the supersymmetries. And because the supersymmetries in 10 and, and 11 dimensions are closely related, you can get the right answer. Um, so, uh, but in general, it's not the case. And uh, indeed, uh, in 11 dimensions, the leading term is, uh, well, if, if you naively reduce the, the 11 dimensional uh, R to the fourth term, you get this, uh, this thing, and you completely miss these other terms, um, which uh, you should calculate. I mean, there is a string that is becoming light, and they are generated by that, that, uh, that string, I mean, by doing the path integral over a string. Uh, 